Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 11. In this lecture, we'll discuss wave dimension, polarization, reflection, and the wave equation. These topics are covered in Chapter 16 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. In this lecture, we want to discuss a series of miscellaneous wave topics. One of those is wave dimension. Wave dimension is the number of independent directions in which energy can propagate. Recall that energy propagation is an important part of the wave concept. The wave speed tells us how fast energy propagates, and in our last lecture, we calculated the exact amount of energy that a particular wave with a particular amplitude and angular frequency carries. Now the question is, where does that energy go? In which direction does it propagate? If you're talking about a rope wave, there's really only one place that energy can go. It can only go from one end of the rope where the source is located to the other end of the rope. However, gradually we want to talk about more interesting waves. We'll want to talk about water waves and sound waves and seismic waves and electromagnetic waves such as light waves. And in those cases, energy has a lot more freedom. If the energy can travel only along one direction, then we refer to the wave as one dimensional. Rope waves are one dimensional or the dimension of rope waves is one because energy propagates only along the length of the rope. We usually call that the X direction. However, if you've ever noticed uh, ripples on the surface of water, you'll notice that water waves in general are two dimensional because the energy propagates on the surface of the water in two directions. Uh, we can call those directions the x and the y directions. So for example, if you drop a pebble onto the calm surface of a pool of water, you'll notice that the waves can travel both in the x direction, positive x and negative x, but simultaneously the waves can travel in the y direction or uh, along a diagonal direction, which would be a combination of the X and Y directions. So we would say that water waves, which are confined to the surface of water, are two-dimensional waves. Now sound waves are three-dimensional waves because as we generate sound waves, for example as I am speaking, the energy of those waves is traveling in the X direction, the Y direction, and simultaneously the Z direction. So somebody who's standing to my right can hear me, somebody who's standing in front of me can hear me, and if somebody were standing above me, for example on a floor above, could also hear me. Sound waves carry energy in all three dimensions of space, so we refer to them as three-dimensional waves. Notice that the dimensionality of the wave is a little different than the dimensionality of the graph for that wave. For example, rope waves are considered one-dimensional because energy travels in one dimension, but of course if you were going to make a graph of rope waves, you would actually need a three-dimensional graph. You would need one axis for x, one axis for t, time, and a third axis for uh, displacement, let's say, in the y direction. So the wave dimension is a little bit different than the dimension of the graph that you might draw to represent the wave. Another miscellaneous wave topic is that of polarization. Polarization describes the wave's direction of oscillation relative to its direction of propagation. So what we're talking about is the relative direction of the element velocity and the wave velocity. Generally speaking, there are two types of polarization. When we have transverse waves or transverse polarization, we have waves in which the element velocity and the wave velocity are perpendicular to each other. So note that you have two velocity vectors, and if they form a 90 degree angle, then we describe the wave as a transverse wave, or we say the wave has transverse polarization. On the other hand, if the element velocity and the wave velocity are parallel to each other, so they are pointing in the same direction, 
both of them are along, let's say, the x-axis, then we would say the wave has longitudinal polarization. To better understand polarization, it helps to see some examples. Recall that transverse waves are those waves in which the velocity of the molecules, that's the element velocity, is perpendicular to the wave velocity, that's the velocity of the energy. Rope waves and water waves in shallow waters and also seismic S waves are all examples of waves with transverse polarization. If you were to zoom in on a rope wave, if you were to actually look at individual molecules or atoms of a rope waves, you would see something like this animation here. In this animation, the wave energy is propagating from left to right or perhaps from right to left. So we would say that the wave velocity is horizontal, let's say in the x direction, but the molecules themselves are moving only up and down. So we would say the element velocity is along the y direction. You can see that those two velocities are perpendicular to each other. Therefore, we say that the polarization of a rope wave is transverse. Longitudinal waves are those waves in which the element velocity, velocity of the molecules, is parallel to the wave velocity. Sound waves are examples of waves with longitudinal polarization. Seismic P waves are also longitudinal. If you were to zoom in on air molecules as sound waves propagate uh, in air, you would see something like this. In this animation, we're looking at air molecules in a column of air, and some source on the left side is generating sound waves by simply pushing against those air molecules. We'll study sound waves in much more detail in future lectures, but for now, notice how the waves are propagating from left to right, let's say horizontally, and individual molecules are also traveling left to right or right to left. The important point here is that the wave energy is traveling in the x direction, and if you zoom in on a single molecule, you'll see that the molecules are also moving in the x direction. It doesn't matter if it's the positive or the negative x direction. The point is that those two directions are parallel to one another. Therefore, we have longitudinal waves. You can think of transverse and longitudinal polarizations as two extreme types of polarization. Some waves are both transverse and longitudinal. In other words, some waves fall somewhere in between the two extreme cases described by transverse and longitudinal polarizations. For example, molecules in deep water waves move in a circular path which can be both parallel and perpendicular to the wave velocity. If you were to travel to the middle of the Pacific Ocean where the water is quite deep, and you were to study the waves there, you would see something like this simulation here. If you were to follow the motion of a single water molecule near the surface, like this yellow uh, circle indicated here, you would see that that particular molecule does not just oscillate up and down. It does not just oscillate left and right. It actually executes circular motion. In doing so, its velocity is sometimes parallel to the wave velocity, and then sometimes it's perpendicular to the wave velocity. So we could say that this type of polarization is somewhere between transverse and longitudinal polarizations. It's nice to know that there are these in-between cases, although for us in this course, we will only focus on waves that are strictly transverse or longitudinal. In our discussions of rope waves so far, we've ignored one very important question, namely what happens when the wave reaches the end of the rope? Up until now, we've been pretending like the rope is infinitely long so that the wave is generated on the left end, let's say, and then it can keep going and going forever. 
That, of course, is not very realistic. Real ropes have a finite length and the wave does eventually reach the end. We now need to figure out what happens when a wave reaches the end of the line, so to speak. The answer to that question depends on the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions tell us what's happening at the end of the rope. The boundary conditions basically describe the constraints that are placed on the movement or motion of the rope at its boundaries, at its endpoints. There are three types of boundary conditions that we could consider. The fixed end boundary condition refers to ropes that are basically fixed in place. So if you took one end of the rope and tied it to a rope, to a tree, for example, and did not allow it to move, you would say the boundary condition is a fixed end boundary condition. On the other hand, the other end of the rope could be free to move. You don't have to tie it to a rope. You could hand it to a friend and instruct that person to move his hand up and down along with the wave. In that case, we would say the end of the rope is free to move without any constraint. We would say the boundary condition is a free end boundary condition. There's also the soft end boundary condition, and this is a situation where the rope doesn't quite end. In that case, the rope could be attached to another rope with different properties. So imagine you have like a thick rope, maybe a cotton rope, and you tie it to a very light nylon rope. In that case, when the wave reaches the end of one rope, it could actually be transmitted to the second rope and continue to propagate along the rope. So it's not quite the fixed end or the free end boundary condition. We describe this type of a situation as a soft end boundary condition. In this lecture, we will only consider fixed end and free end boundary conditions We'll return to soft and boundary conditions later when we start talking about sound waves. To understand the effect of boundary conditions on wave behavior, let's use a simulation. In this simulation here, we're using a machine to generate waves along the length of a rope. This scenario here is not very realistic because the rope is effectively infinite in length. You can see that the waves are generated on the left, they travel to the right, and then they basically go out the window and we're not really sure what's happening on the right end. For a more realistic scenario, we need to impose boundary conditions on the right end of the rope. Here's one example of a boundary condition. This is how a free boundary condition looks like. You can see the rope definitely has a finite length. It does not extend past the rod. The right end is attached to a ring that is free to move up and down in response to the rope uh, displacements. Clearly, this behavior is a little bit different than the behavior we saw on the previous uh, example, where there was really no boundary condition. Here's another example of a boundary condition. This is a fixed end boundary condition. Here we are basically fixing the right end of the rope so that it does not move. The last molecule of the rope is fixed in place while the rest of the rope essentially oscillates. These two types of boundary conditions exhibit different types of behavior for the rope. To better see the differences, here are the three scenarios together. In the lower left, we have no boundary condition, a somewhat unrealistic case. And on the right, we have the two boundary conditions that we're interested in, a fixed end boundary condition at the top and a free end boundary condition at the bottom. There are definitely differences between them, although quantifying the differences is a little difficult. In some sense, these waves are too complicated for us to be able to clearly discern what the differences between them is. To better understand the differences, we need to consider wave pulses. It's a little difficult to discern the effect of boundary conditions on wave behavior when we look at sinusoidal waves. However, the situation becomes a little more clear and obvious when we look at wave pulses. When we look at wave pulses, we notice that the wave is reflected when it reaches the end of the line. This should make sense because after all, 
waves carry energy and when the rope ends that energy cannot just disappear something needs to happen to that energy what happens is that it is reflected so it basically turns around and goes back to where it came from now how the wave is reflected depends on the boundary condition if we have a fixed end boundary condition like this scenario here in the lower left then the reflected wave is inverted it's turned upside down we sometimes describe that by saying that the uh, phase constant of the wave is changed or shifted by pi radians that's because if you take a sinusoidal wave and you shift it by pi radians you basically invert it you basically flip it upside down on the other hand, if you have a free end boundary condition like this situation here, where the right end is free to move up and down in response to the wave, then the reflected wave remains upright. It is not inverted. In that case, we say that the phase constant is not shifted or that it is shifted by zero radians. You can see that better if we generate pulse waves and observe their behavior in slow motion. Rather than generating sinusoidal waves, here we have created just a single pulse that is propagating along the length of the rope. And as you can see, every time it reaches the end of the rope, it bounces back or reflects. Of course, when it reflects, it gets inverted. It gets inverted once here, and then when it reaches the left end, it gets inverted again. The same thing does not happen when the end is free. Again, a pulse is generated. When it reaches the right end, notice it's reflected, but it's not flipped upside down. It does get flipped upside down when it reaches the left end because the left end is a fixed end in this scenario. So here it's going to get flipped or inverted. When it reaches the right end, it will remain upright. It goes back to where it came from. When it reaches there, it will again get flipped because the left end is a fixed end and the right end is a free end. It turns out this reflection is the main reason why waves behave differently under different boundary conditions. So different boundary conditions affect how waves or how the energy in the waves is reflected and that ultimately changes the precise behavior of even simple sinusoidal waves. This discussion is a rather complicated discussion and it's going to take us a while to be able to fully mathematically characterize these reflected waves, but these pictures should remain in your mind. In particular, you should remember that when a wave reaches a fixed end, its phase constant is effectively shifted by pi radians. That's just a fancy way of saying that the wave is flipped upside down, it's inverted, but when a wave reaches a free end, it's not phase shifted, or we sometimes say the phase constant is shifted by zero radians. The last miscellaneous wave topic that we want to cover in this lecture is that of the wave equation. Before talking about the wave equation, we need to review some important concepts. Up until now, we've been primarily interested in simple waves, also known as sinusoidal waves. These are waves that are described by sine functions or cosine functions. We can write these sinusoidal waves in slightly different forms. Here are the three forms that you will commonly see. The top equation expresses the wave in terms of wavelength and period but sometimes we prefer using the wave number and the angular frequency. Sometimes we prefer using the wave number and the wave speed. But notice that all three functions are essentially the same function. They're all sine functions. As it turns out, not all waves are sinusoidal waves. Sinusoidal waves are simple waves. Those are the ones that we like to discuss in this class. They're mathematically easier to understand, and it turns out they are the building blocks of more complicated waves. However, you can have waves that do not look like sine or cosine functions. Pulse waves are not at all like sine functions. If you imagine a tsunami wave, the kind that's generated when there is an underwater earthquake, those types of waves basically amount to massive displacements 
of a mound of water. Those waves do not look like sine or cosine functions, and yet they are waves because they can propagate from one point to another, they can carry energy, and they involve the coordinated motion of many molecules of a medium. It turns out any function of the quantity x minus vt is a wave even if it's not a sinusoidal function. So the function has to depend on the quantity x minus vt as one unit. It cannot be a function of x and t separately, but if the function depends on x minus vt as one unit, then you have a wave. You have a coordinated displacement of molecules of some medium that are capable of carrying energy from one point to another. These functions are all examples of waves. The number that appears next to the variable t turns out to be the speed of the wave. So x minus 2t quantity squared, as you can see, it's a function that depends on x minus 2t, and this is a wave that is propagating to the right or in the positive x direction with a speed of 2. This second function is also a wave. If you were to make an animation of this function, you would see that this resembles a pulse function or maybe a tsunami wave. In this case, the speed of the wave is four. However, the wave is propagating to the left or in the negative direction. For the direction of the wave, you need to look at the sign next to the wave speed. If that sign happens to be negative, then the wave is propagating to the right in the positive x direction. If this sign is positive, then the wave is propagating to the left or in the negative x direction. This third example is also a wave. This is a wave that moves with the speed of 5. To find out the speed, you can't just look at the coefficient of t. You first need to factor out the 4, and what you'll end up with is 4 times the quantity x minus 5t. Then you can say that the speed is 5. This last case might be a little more tricky to see, but this also is a wave. It turns out that this function can be factorized and written as x plus 3t squared. In that case, you can see that the speed is 3, and since its sign is a positive sign, we can say that it's moving in the negative direction. The fact that not all waves are sinusoidal might be a little bit disturbing to you. After all, you might be thinking, given some random function, how do I know if it's a wave or not? The answer to that question is provided by the wave equation. A one-dimensional wave is defined as any function that satisfies this particular equation known as the wave equation. So if you have some random function y that depends on x and t and you want to know whether this is a wave or not, you plug it into this equation and if it satisfies this equation, then congratulations, you have a wave Otherwise, it's not a wave. In a more advanced course on waves, we would actually begin with this equation and define a wave as any solution to this equation. This equation is a somewhat complicated equation. It's a second order partial differential equation. The symbol that you see here, known as a script D, is basically a D with its handle bent denotes partial differentiation. It's a partial derivative symbol. You learn about partial derivatives in multivariable calculus, usually the third semester of calculus. If you haven't yet learned about partial derivatives, that's okay. We only need their most basic properties. The only thing you need to know for this class is that when you see the partial derivative of y with respect to x, you need to interpret this as just an ordinary derivative while treating t as a constant. So this symbol here, the partial of y with respect to x, basically tells you take the derivative of y with respect to x as you normally do, and if you come across the variable t anywhere, treat it as if it's a constant. 
treat it as if it's like the number 7, for example. On the other hand, if you see the partial derivative of y with respect to t, this particular symbol is telling you take the derivative of y with respect to t just like an ordinary derivative, the way you did in calculus 1, and if in that process you come across the variable x, treat x as if it's a constant. And of course, if you see a 2 anywhere, then that's telling you that you need to repeat this process twice. You need to take two partial derivatives. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem on the wave equation. Does the following function describe a wave? So we have a function y. It depends on two variables, x and t. And as you can see, it's kind of a nightmare of a function. It's got uh, powers of x and t. It also has a sine function in it. And seeing this sine function uh, might make you think that this is a wave. It's hard to know whether this really describes a wave by just looking at this crazy function, but we can actually take its partial derivatives, put it into the wave equation, and see if it satisfies the wave equation. We'll begin by taking the partial derivative of y with respect to x. So remember, this sign here basically tells us take the derivative of y with respect to x, and if you ever come across t or t squared or t cubed, then treat it as if it's a constant, like an ordinary number. If you take the derivative of this horrendous function with respect to x, what you get is 4x cubed minus 6xt squared plus cosine of x plus t. And then take the derivative again, so take another partial derivative with respect to x of this function. Again, treat t or t squared or any power of t as if it's just a number, and what you get is this function here. Now we also need the partial derivative of y with respect to t, so let's take the derivative of y with respect to t, and if we come across x anywhere, this time we'll treat the x's as if they're constant. When we take the derivative of this function on top with respect to t, we get this function. When we take the second derivative, again with respect to t, once again treating all the x's as if they're constants, we get this function. We can now answer the question of whether the function y is a wave or not. You'll have to compare this function here to this function here. Can one of them be multiplied or divided by any kind of a constant that would give us the other function? Initially, you might think yes. After all, I can see an x squared here and I can see an x squared here. And if I feel that if I take this minus 6 and just multiply this by minus 2, then I'll end up with 12. Unfortunately, I would have to multiply the entire function by minus 2, and if I multiply the entire function by minus 2, this coefficient here does not equal to this coefficient here. What's more, I have a t here and a t squared here, and there is no way I can make those two equal to each other by multiplying them by a constant. Therefore, we would say that this function up top, y of x and t, is not a wave because we cannot take the second derivative of y with respect to x and make it be equal to the second derivative of y with respect to t through the multiplication by any constant. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.